Okay, from politics to finance, I'm here with three remarkable women in the finance industry, and I want to start. We've been we've been talking today about sexism in Hollywood, in the tech industry, inequality in government, the wage gap. What can you all three of you put uh, the finance industry on this spectrum of inequality? Where are we, and what is our the top priorities to be focused on? Mel, if you could start. Well, I think we've got a long, long way to go. I think we've made a lot of progress. And um, I think that over the last 20 years, I think most of the financial services companies have been focused on trying to get more women in, in the workforce. And I think uh, from all the statistics I have seen in my time in the, in the business, in the banking business, we would hire about 50-50 men and women. But as we went up the pyramid, we would start losing them. And so by the time you got to the top, it was, it was very, very narrow. And the pipeline, also we've been talking about, the pipeline was very thin. So, Eileen Bridgewater. Yeah, um, I guess um, when I graduated in 1980, it was, I think, 0.05%, whatever that means, of a person, <laughs> senior women, <laughs> in, uh, women in senior positions. It's about 15 to 18% today. Mm -hmm. And I've told people, I don't know if I should do the happy dance or go outside and cry. But we've made a lot of progress. There's a lot more that we need to make. Uh, and I think there's a number of things to focus on in that. <clears throat> Your specific question about you know, sexism in Hollywood, I think you said, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, in financial services, at least going back to the 1980s, when if you sat on some of the trading floors, you know, there were calendars and craziness. That, that was really all cleaned up. Mm -hmm. And I think financial services has spent a lot of time on that particular aspect. But in terms of diversity overall, I think we have a long ways to go, despite the fact that we've made progress. I think I see a, a lot of hope in the regional banks as well. There are CEOs at some pretty large banks that are, are um, being grown through acquisition. And in the global banks, you see folks, I think, just below the popping up level, where there's a, a path to um, acceleration um, as people start to retire at the top. All of you have basically broken the glass ceiling in your own careers, um, but you still remain really anomalies. I mean, even though we've seen progress, more than 50% of the S&P 500 financial companies, um, more than 50% of the workforce is women. But when you get to the CEO level, it's less than 10%. And many financial firms, including Bridgewater, um, pride themselves on being meritocracies. But how can you have a meritocracy if there's no <laughs> women at the top? Um, are they just not cutting it? Or what, how do you explain that? Uh, I'm at the top. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, at Bridgewater, about 30% of our senior people are women, which is not 50%, but I think a pretty good, pretty good ratio in terms of where we are. Uh, overall, we're 60-40. 60% men, 40% women. And part of that, I think, is a function of the supply and demand, particularly with people with STEM degrees. So I think I mentioned this to you, Laura, that um, in 1980 um, to now, it's a, been a 15% decline of young women going into STEM, science, engineering, technology, math. And yet, two thirds of the jobs are where that growth has been, where women have grown in terms of growing. So. Um, <clears throat> there, there's that issue to deal with, I think, from an education perspective. Uh, at Bridgewater, we believe in meritocracy. We believe in radical truth and honesty. And I believe because we are a meritocracy, the percentage of women that we hire to those that get to the top has, has been pretty good. Not to say that we don't need to make more progress. Uh, and I think that uh, in terms of all of the firms, we need to continue to make progress on diversity. And I think if you're a meritocracy, you will get your fair share of diversity because I believe that half of the intellectual capital around the globe happens to be um, people who are diverse. And so if you really stay and stick to that, I think we'll get there. Mel, do you think you can have meritocracy without equality? I, I think you have to create a culture where people who are different can succeed. And depending on how you what, what the criteria is in that meritocracy, it can, it can actually skew whether or not some people are more successful than others. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example. We were, we were working on a situation um, where the pipeline 
uh, was actually, in this case, it was African-American uh, males. And, um, and one of the criteria to judge the high potential pipeline and these growth behaviors was whether or not you would actually challenge your manager. And that was one of the growth criteria. And we said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> that, that really is not the kind of behavior an African-American male is actually going to feel comfortable in one of these big Fortune 500 companies. It's actually culturally you know, not the right kind of behavior. So you could say, in a meritocracy, depending on what you, what it is that you're trying to get there, depending on that criteria, you could actually be skewing, you know, how you're rating some of your population and some of your talent versus other part of your talent. So I think we have all of this stuff that we have to be careful about. Uh, and we've been talking about it all day long, mm -hmm. right? Uh, around cer certain behaviors, certain biases, certain things that we automatically think about that might be right for some populations, but might be totally wrong for some other populations. And so inadvertently, we create these pipelines that, that are insufficient in one group or another. Debbie, I just wonder your perspective on this. You were chairman of uh, uh, Carver Bank Corp, which was yes. founded by black bankers for the black community. Mm -hmm. So what is your perspective on the issue of meritocracy? I, well, there, there are definitely women in that category, but they're very small banks. And as we've gone through the last decade of consolidation, this really had an impact. But I'd also say on the opposite side, at, at Citigroup, where I'm a board member, as you know, we get a chance to have dinner with the top 25 folks at Citigroup on a quarterly basis. And I'm encouraged, actually, with what I see at dinner. There's a, there are a number of women who are running very large businesses at that company, and I think they have a full shot of getting there. Is it tomorrow? No. Um, but I really believe in, this, in this, this decade, if not shorter, that some of those folks are in position to get there. Now, Mel, you, you currently run a uh, family office, um, and you're looking from the investor point of view as to uh, companies that are perhaps taking more uh, aggressive policies towards equality. Just to talk about what sorts of things your investors are looking for in a company if, if they care about these issues. And, yeah. how, and how is that increasing? So I went from, from one side, from the banking side, actually to the side of the investors, to the side of the families. So now I'm on this side looking at the financial sector. Right. And uh, my, our clients are, are very wealthy families. And a number of them, interestingly, are women. And when women, this is, and, and, and this is going to happen more and more, because we're going to have this huge wealth transfer. And everybody says it's going to be to the next generation. But it's actually going to be to women, because men tend to marry younger women. And we outlive them anyway. OK? So the, the power of the purse is going to be with, with women. When women, um, and I, I see these women all of a sudden taking charge of their own finances, they want to align what they're investing in with their values. And one of those values is using a gender lens to the investments. So it's saying, OK, I'm investing in this company. How many women do they have on the board? How many women at the CEO suite? Uh, what are they doing in terms of some of the programs for women, et cetera? And they're deciding where to put their money depending on where you see the best practices. And with this huge transfer between the women and the millennials, I think the amount of, um, of emphasis and demand that there's going to be for companies that are doing right on all of these issues of equality is only going to increase. And so we have to use the power of the of the purse that we have to actually change the world. And I think we can. And one that, you know, a big part of that is the co corporate culture. At Bridgewater, again, you pride yourself on the culture of radical transparency, which um, some people would say could be described as ruthless, very masculine. Do you think, um, Eileen, that that culture itself hurts your ability to attract a diverse workforce? Is it worth rethinking, or, or why is that the right uh, corporate culture to have? Well, for us, and you know, everybody should have their own right corporate culture, but for us, it's about radical truth. 
and radical transparency. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we have a very high attrition rate when people first start with us. We have some, it's probably double what most firms have. And everybody comes on board and says, wow, I'm going to love this radical truth and radical transparency. Of course, until it's turned on them, <laughs> and then they don't like it so much anymore, but some people do. So um, I, I think that if it, it's that all of the people that we've dealt with, um, be they men, people of color, um, different genders, um, in terms of um, uh, different sexual persuasions, the people that stay after the 18 months, with all those differences, uh, really love radical truth, radical transparency. And the wonderful thing about it is you don't have to worry about who's talking behind your back, because they're saying it all to your face. It's not for everybody. But what's terrific about it is if you could step back and understand the intention. And the intention is for us, we have a social contract with each other to make each other better. And in order to do that, we have to share the good, the bad, and the ugly. So once you get past the kind of, why is this person doing this? Uh, because you might be in another company, and it might be a political thing, et cetera. It really, it really works, and I think it works. I think most people would like to know the truth. You said that there were, there were two areas that you don't disclose, that there isn't transparency on. I was interested in you just talking about yeah, that. Yeah, uh, two things we're not, we're not transparent on. Uh, one is if someone has a personal situation that's private, that's a private matter, we're not going to share that with people. And two is, is pay, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Um, uh, the things that happen with pay. But anyways, I, I was talking to yeah. you earlier. I really applaud the UK in terms of being very transparent about compensation. I would rather have the conversations about that. Uh, not everybody agrees with me, but I think it's something that, you know, through time uh, we'll see changes in. And I think that, as well as metrics on how many women did you hire? How many people did you lose? How many people were, were women? How many people were people of color? How many people were transgender? Focusing on metrics, it seems to me, if it's, if it's measured, it'll be managed. Mm -hmm. And so if people knew what each other made, we'd be very cautious about it. So you would support uh, more transparency and pay? I, as an individual, individual, Eileen Murray would support it. I'm not speaking on behalf of Bridgewater on that. <laughs> and what about you, Debbie? Yeah, well, in our system, as you know, if you're a public company, there's disclosure. Um, you know, in, well into sort of top, the, the top echelon. And so um, I think that's a great thing about our system and being a public company. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, it may, and you're, you're, you're leading um, salespeople, you're leading leaders are not going to stay if they're not compensated uh, equally. So I think that's great about our system. Where do you see the pressure from the investors in terms of this issue of... of uh pay equity? You know, that really hasn't come up yet. Hmm. Um, I think that this whole pay equality thing will now start bubbling up. I've seen it more in terms of the representation of uh, diversity on boards and CEOs and, and C-suites. I haven't seen it in terms of pay. But it'll, it'll happen now because it's in the news. And as some of these issues come up, um, they the, the, the investors then start uh, saying, this is important to me. What do you know about this? What, what are some of these reports, et cetera? We're, we're gonna, we have about five more minutes. What I would like to do is just to go through, uh, with each of you, talk about what you see um, within yourself that helped you get as far up the, the ladder mm -hmm. as you have, and what from the outside do you, do you sort of credit that to? What, what help have you gotten from others that you think um, have been important in your success? Eileen, do you want to? Sure. Um, I, I can think of two things. One, um, I, when I became the treasurer at Morgan Stanley, which, by the way, I didn't think I was qualified for, although four <laughs> other people thought they were qualified. Uh, we won't say who they were. Uh, <laughs> But I was really very, I really didn't have a lot of confidence in myself in the position. And there was a, a guy by the name of Dick Fisher, and I see Jean Marie McFadden here. He was a mentor to both of us. And I had my first investor call that was an audience, at much the same size as this. And I was answering a few questions, and then I looked at the audience and I like froze. And Dick took me aside and said, Listen, you know, he basically took the questions over because I was stumbling. And he said, Listen, you're the treasurer. You've got to be able to do this. I will be with you for the next 10, 20 meetings. I will tell you what you did well, what you didn't do well. Just get out there and pretend you're talking to me. And it sounds like a little thing, but it gave me such confidence. 
And then the second thing from that same person that I learned, and this was the most liberating day of my life. Uh, it was just wonderful. When I realized I didn't have to know the answer to everything. Oh my God, was that great. It was like going from co you know, shoveling coal to being on a beach with a pina colada. <laughs> <laughs> I want to follow that. Mentorship is a word that's thrown around a lot. Um, but it really is important, especially when you're taking a step change. Mm -hmm. um, I met a guy by the name of Dick Parsons uh, mm -hmm. when I was uh, a young person. And um, I took the crazy job to run Carver. And, uh, and it was hard. Actually, Dick talked me into to working for Rudy Giuliani, which is not a easy thing to do at that time because I had been working for Dinkins. And so a Dinkins person going to work for Giuliani. But in any event, um, uh, the price of that to him was he was trying to figure out how to do something nice for me as opposed to throwing me into the cauldron. And uh, he called one day for lunch and he said, um, uh, I got a phone call about a board that's coming up. Kraft Foods was being spun out of Philip Morris. And he said, uh, I think you ought to go over and meet the chairman of Philip Morris. And I was like, what's a board? I mean, I had no idea what this stuff was. And so um, as corny as it is, I think it's still it's a world that's driven by people, right? And I think that having someone, everybody in this audience, grab one other person and say, there's a whole different world out here that you're great at this, but you don't know anything about that. And I'm going to bring you along and show you this other piece of the world because you're going to grow as a person. And then you're going to grab somebody else and help them as well. So I'd make a pitch for uh, bringing somebody along with you wherever you are, because um, you just never know when you open that one door, you know, how many lives you change by doing that. No. I'll, I'll build on that, because I, I, I think that we can't underestimate the power. And in my case, it was three different men at three different points in my career that actually believed in me and took me to a different place. And the second thing was, every time I moved, I brought a lot of the people that were uh, under with me, and a lot of them were women and diverse. And the more I grew, the more they grew, the more they grew, the more they grew, the more I grew. And I think it becomes a virtuous circle if you can do that. And, um, and you all win. Very quickly, one thing to do for the financial industry to accelerate the progress on equality? Uh, insist on more women on the board. Insist on more women at the top because it's easier to break the glass ceiling from the top, otherwise the glass shatters on you. So yeah. I would agree with that. <laughs> I agree with both of that. And for the financial services industry, focus on your women as clients and give them the power to be able to use their capital to change the world. Thank you all so much. <laughs>